Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. This is Jonathan Lipp from the Big Apple Film Festival. Uh, our festival concludes today. All the films uh, will be available to be viewed virtually until midnight tonight. Uh, we've also been having our agents and managers conference uh, all throughout the week. And today is actually the final day for that as well. Um, Please be sure if you're a uh, all access pass holder, please be sure to fill out the registration form so all of the information on your projects can be shared with all of our speakers throughout the week. Um, so with us now we have Paul Wheatsman from Culture Creative Entertainment. Hello, Paul. How are you doing? Hello, Jonathan. Uh, last name's Weitzman, but that's okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Weitzman. That's okay. No Paul worries. Weitzman. And yes. we have our moderator with us, uh, Carla Lugo. Hello, Carla. Hey, Carla. Hey, guys. Hi. All right, so we're going to jump right in. Um, we'll have Paul tell us a bit about himself, and then we'll get right into the questions. I'll pass it over to Carla, and I'll see you in about 45 minutes. Great, Jonathan. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, hi, Paul. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too, Carla. Um, I just want to mention to uh, all the attendees that you can submit your questions in the Q&A section, uh, and I'll try to get to all of them. Uh, but why don't we start with you telling us a little bit about yourself, Paul, and what is it that you do? Sure, absolutely. I'm a, um, my name is Paul Weitzman. I'm a Southern California native, uh, second generation literary agent. My father was an agent for 20, uh, 55 years, kind of came up with old time Hollywood. Um, I've been an agent for about 25 years now. And before forming Culture Creative with my partners, um, myself and Brad Rosenfeld were running the literary department of Abrams Artists Agency, where we uh, managed or agented for writers and directors and producers for television and film, which would encompass features as well as uh, episodic television, cable, broadcast, animation, all kinds of different things. Awesome. And well, going along those lines, uh, does Culture Creative represent writer directors or is it mainly focused on writers and literary uh, works? Well, writers, writers and directors in that order, mostly writers and then the directors next. And then we also represent producers that we're bringing material to and also representing producers and finding on an exclusive basis where we find the material as well, either with from our clients or from other sources. And would you say that you get a lot of like hyphen at people, uh, so writers that they themselves are going into the uh, directorial way and like trying to direct their own stuff, or is it more just like one or the other? Actually, I actually like it the other way around, Carla. I like it more directors who write rather than writers that direct. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. that's a that's a more. I'm very used to writer directors. Um, mostly their they, their uh, introduction to the industry is by writing and screenwriters. But I think uh, can you explain a little bit why is it that you prefer the other way around, directors who write? Well, if you're if you're a director, you know, it, it, directors it's important for a director to do a director pass on either a, 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 any type of material. Well, specifically in the feature space. Um, rather than a writer who says, hey, I want to be a director. And you know, you got to try to wiggle, wiggle your way into a directing spot. And if you're creating a show, you might have a little bit more leverage to do that. But um, uh, again, you know, the directors that represent, I would say 99% of them also write. That is very true. <laughs> um, and I have a, a question from an anonymous attendee. Um, they're asking, how can I get my three TV projects considered for licensing? Uh, what would you do if you were me? I live in Connecticut and, uh, and I am my senior, with very, very creative, yet not yet a writer. I, the, the question so, for, for licensing, I mean, it's, I mean, I guess that question really, I mean, from my perspective, that question is, the person has a pilot, how do you get that sold? I guess that's I guess that's the question. Unless something is completely in the can, you've got you know ten episodes already in the can, produced, uh, and, and, and ready to go. That would be more of a licensing or acquisition type of question. But I don't. I highly doubt uh, you know a graduate is has a complete series to to license like that. So I guess that question really is how do you get your material? I, I'm I'm assuming Carla. The, the question is how do you get your material sold? I would say so, yeah, because I mean, I I think this person is in the process of just like getting uh, their projects out there, their TV projects. Uh, so yeah, basically how, 
would you go about getting it sold? Like, would it be, could it, could you, like, what would be the role of an agent in there? Uh, well, again, you know, the question is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around exactly the nature of this person's, where this person is coming from. But, you know, generally speaking, these people without credit, it's very, very difficult to get a project sold. Very difficult, unless that project is based on IP, unless it's based on a book, a life right story, uh, that writer has, for, you know, life experience and the knowledge of what it is that, that that pilot's all about, and that person is the right person to tell that story, you know, um, but it's difficult to sell something without any credits. I mean, my suggestion for anybody is to get on staff, uh, you learn the writer's room, learn the, learn the producing aspects of it, and then once you start to, to develop some, your network, um, you're going to be in better shape and to develop credits, you'll be in better shape to sell original programming. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Laura is asking, do you only give credence to referrals from folks you already work with? Or do you consider new clients referred by managers, agents, entertainment lawyers who have good standing in the industry, but perhaps are new connections for you? I think anybody who's been in the industry, you know, to, you know, first of all, anybody who I know who's bringing me material, yeah, certainly, of course. You know, I mean, I've got a, a manager or an attorney or a studio executive or a network executive says, hey, Paul, take a look at this piece of the, I really like this person, you know, would you take a look? Certainly, that's the best way to go. Um, you know, I get a lot of query letters, I get query letters from all over the world. And those are really, really difficult to gauge. You just don't know what you're gonna get right there. So referrals are certainly the way to go. Um, I, I hope that answers the question because yeah, you know, no, it, I mean, it was uh, speaking to like in terms of like preference of this, it's like a known person who's uh, referring a new client or is it just like a, by like, again, you mentioned query letters um, and I get, I, I can only imagine that you get hundreds of them per week. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, I think, yeah, like the, the personal connection to the person who's referring, I think that's uh, basically yeah. what they were asking. Yeah, I mean, I've gotten referrals from managers that I've never done business with and that I don't know. And mm -hmm. wondered, a few times that's worked out. That's worked out really well. As a matter of fact, you know, a number of years ago, a manager came to me. I didn't really know the manager. You referred me to a client. I met the client, read her, loved her. And we had great success. As a matter of fact, we just put her to work on a top show over at ABC. And yes. I didn't know the manager before that. So, you know, you just got to be a little bit open and I'm very open, even to query letters sometimes. I try to respond as many of them as I possibly can, but it's difficult, you know? But yeah. yes, referrals are certainly the way to go. And along the lines of like, okay, so query letters, query emails are okay. What would you uh, recommend people include uh, within those, uh, like synopsis, logline, bios, um, just so that it becomes easier for you as an agent to kind of try to gauge what the um, writers. I, I want to learn, you know, when I, when I, anytime I take out a client or even consider a client, I really want to know about the person more rather than, just, I don't want somebody just querying me and just saying, hey, I get so many query letters. It's just like, and it's, they're so lengthy, number one. And that's the number one rule in my book. If I see, if I'm scrolling through an email and it's like a full page long, I'm not, I'm done. That's it. It's not working. Um, people need to be brief. I think, um, people need to be, need to sell themselves and I'm one for life experience. So if somebody has military service or has been a paramedic or has been a neurosurgeon or, you know, has been, uh, working for the Peace Corps, you know, something, give me something to work with a little bit. You know, it's really difficult for people straight out of school who they don't really have a lot of experience. Maybe they have a, a life story that um, that they're bouncing their material off or a perspective from, and that might grab my attention a little bit. So I'm really more into the person, number one. I won't take on a client unless I really like that person, and I believe that that person is going to add value to mm -hmm. a writer's room. Um, and that's super, super important. I think that we're, the hiring of people out there is more weighted on the personality and what they bring to the table uh, a little bit more than the writing, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that, like, that makes a lot of sense. Um, 
this person is asking, um, after selling one of your write, uh, writer scripts, TV or film, on average, how involved is your writer with the project in terms of rewrites, set work, producing, et cetera? Well, that really depends on television versus feature. If you're selling a pilot, you know, you're definitely guaranteed a step, as you are in features as well. But I think in the television space, you know, you, you try to get your writer to stick stick with it. Actually, in the feature, you try to get your writer to stick with it. But in the feature business, you know, there's so many writers that are brought on to features. It's like you have no control as to the, the number of writers are going to do punch-ups uh, and, and tweaks and revisions to that feature by the time that thing actually is distributed. Uh, in television, you really try to hold uh, that control of that creative to the original writer because it really does affect the passives and a lot of the uh, the, the deal points in the long run, meaning that if a writer gets sole credit in a television, uh, actually in features as well, you know, their bonuses are much more substantial. Their locks to their project are much more substantial. So yes, and and, and that's this is another situation where I think uh, you know, this is for writers. So the writers, you know, I, I think that it's very important for writers to be very collaborative and really don't be too, um, to hold on too tight to their principles and what they and how they envision their own project. I think if a studio executive or a producer has suggestions, go with it, you know, to some certain degree and don't be too, I don't know, don't be too, yeah, to just be a little bit flexible with no taking and what have you. Because I see a lot of writers basically say, no, this is, no, I don't see it that way. I'm not making those changes. And I'm mm -hmm. like, dude, you need to really like be more collaborative. <laughs> Yeah, kind of lose a little bit of the preciousness with your material. Like, like it's understandable, it's yours. You created it from the start to the finish, but yeah, allowing that flexibility uh, uh, comes into play. And this kind of goes along with Ian's question. Um, you mentioned communication, flexibility, uh, but what other elements come into play that make you want to represent an artist, either writer or director? Um. Personality goes a long way with me. You know, I got to gel with somebody. You know, I don't need to be best friends with clients, but I definitely have to have a connectivity uh, and be able to have a shorthand with people. I mean, I really kind of I'll throw it out there and I can be kind of raw. Um, so the people that, that I'd like to surround myself with, with specifically clients, they got to be able to <laughs> uh, be loose enough with their language. Um, because like I said, I can, uh, you know, uh, I don't hold back. <laughs> so, you know, and you, you got to be, you know, even with notes and script, you know, you got to, I, I, what I really look for is somebody who, again, like I said, has a very specific perspective on, on life, on the material, um, and what they're bringing to the table, and also be open enough uh, for collaboration and, uh, and note taking. And, you know, they don't have to take my notes. You know, they don't have to take a studio exec notes or, or, or network exec, exec notes. But you got to be respectful and take it for what it is. You know, from, from my perspective, hey, take the notes. Um, if it's working for you, great. If not, that's not a big deal. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, Tom is asking um, to those, um, to that, do you represent Finnish independent films? If yeah. not, why not? If so, what steps must be taken in order to have one's film decimate, decimated? Distributed? Disseminated? Oh, disseminated? Yeah. Okay. That's, can, a, that's, I believe that's more like distributed. Um, yeah. You know, when I, I take a look at a film, I mean, we, we had a great success with uh, just recently with uh, Princess of the Row. This, uh, this was a film that is an independent, low budget film. Uh, it was fantastic. I mean, a tearjerker. And we took the project on and we ended up getting distribution for it through HBO Max. Um, and the, we ended up attaching uh morgan freeman and his company to the project we thought that might add some value and it did and um it's done very well um so yes completed films um we do involve ourselves in completed films certainly and what and i guess the question tom it was just tom's question i think and i mm -hmm. think it, you know yeah. how do you get distribution for for that film well first of all be careful on the on the on the uh on the uh, festival circuit you don't want to overexpose your film so 
You should work with a manager or an agent who's got experience in distribution because you don't want to get, you don't want your film overexposed to, you know, a hundred different festivals. So you got to be careful with that. And uh, I mean, that's a perfect segue to Christian's question. Um, they say, if I have an award-winning feature film I directed and wrote, but also have a new script that I would like to get repped and made, uh, should I be approaching agents with my completed film as a portfolio piece, or should I be approaching agents with my script or both? You have a completed film. You need to use that completed film by all means. I mean, if that's something that you know, the, the writer or the filmmaker is proud of and it really showcases their abilities, then by all means. I mean, it's hard to get a film made. You know, if I watch somebody's film, I go, oh my God, this is freaking beautiful. I love this film for so many different reasons. Well, I'm going to be more inclined to read that person's next project. If this person says they have a film and I don't see the film, but yet they send a script, well, that's getting lumped together with all the other weekend read, reading material that I've got to get to. And there's just no sense of urgency if I can't see what that person's all about. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then also Leslie asks, um, when your writer director, when your writer director pitches a show, do you try to sell the director along with their vision or just like the material itself? Does that director have credits? Because if that director doesn't have credits, it's not happening. Okay, you so know, you have not, to have not, a yeah. It's not going to happen if if you're a, if you're an aspiring director and you've got a pilot and the pilot is you know something that is just killer. Chances are it's not going to happen as you as a first time director when a studio is financially backing that project. You know maybe you can get an episode here or there once if if you're able to sell that project, mm -hmm. um, but having a, a fresh a new director without any credits directing a pilot financed by a studio hmm, not going to happen generally not going to happen and do you think uh jd hughes asks uh does the side size of the agency manager make a difference in getting projects made in terms of influence or more or is more about circumstances that's a that's a really good question for me because you know I've been in the mid sized mid sized agencies and yeah this is a this is a new this is basically a startup agency that we have that we've been you know we've been around for two and a half years um, I think the, the main uh, thing to think about is um, getting having a representative who understands the client who understands you uh, gets you that you trust um, because that person. Whoever that person is, if that person is at CAA or that person is at a small, you know, one-person shop, um, it's passion that you need. Uh, I do think that you know, larger agencies, depending on the project, um, you know, they they do have uh, resources that could be advantageous, like uh, a piece of talent, for that matter. But again, that's very difficult because the the meaningful talent out there sometimes are offer only. So it's very, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing. So aspiring people, I would recommend aspiring people have uh, a, a, a smaller uh, place. I shouldn't say a smaller place. Let's just say the right representative, whether that's a manager or an agent that is passionate about the project, has the time uh, and the experience to dedicate to that uh, burgeoning writer or director. And uh, to that point, kind of, would you consider yourself a developmental agency in the kinds of clients you take on, or are you looking for folks who are already very established? Like, what is your, how do you gauge? I mean, both. I mean, I mean, some of the, you know, so, you know, I get a lot of satisfaction out of taking somebody who's got absolutely no credits and developing that person. Um, mm -hmm. And I do work with clients on developing their material. Um, <sighs> Yeah, of course, yeah, everyone's going to want to represent, <laughs> you know, the, all the top showrunners, you know, mm -hmm. I, of course, that's easy. Um, and the top filmmakers. But yeah, no, I take I take chances on people, um, new people, as well as you know, people who coming from other agencies or people who have been lost or what have you. But as long as the material is there and, the, you know, and there's, again, that personal connection is so important in this business. Yeah, for sure. Um, Ian asks uh, a sort of follow-up question of how do artists get in, uh, get themselves in front of you? Is it through film festivals? 
cold email, social media, et cetera? Um, number one, it's referrals, which we talked about. Mm -hmm. You know, if I get somebody, if somebody's emailing me about a piece of material and I'm like, you know, uh, sometimes if just based on a really simple log line, I might think that sounds kind of interesting. That sounds kind of marketable. I'll take a look at that. Um, but you gotta be like so persistent if, if that's a scenario, because mm -hmm. you know, people in this business get so busy and emails get to, you know, they get buried. So you gotta be really persistent about your follow-up and you, you know, you can't give up. So I'm not sure if that's really answering your question though, Carla. I mean, a little bit. Um, I would just follow up in, in terms of like, um, well, not, not really, but how important would like networking events, conferences, film festivals themselves, are there like, are they important in your selection process of like meeting new people and deciding to take on yeah, things or? I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm on a board of OmniFest, uh, you know, and I get a lot of recommendations out of, out of that organization. Um, I don't, I'm not really getting, I'm not really uh, canvassing like Sundance or South by Southwest and what have you. Um, so, you know, again, most of the new business comes by way of referrals. That's okay. again, I mean, find a connection you know, to people out there, find, find some connective tissue to somebody that you're actually, you're going after. Like mm -hmm. I to San Diego state. So you, you, you know, queries me, it says, Hey, I'm a fellow Aztec. Yeah, you know, I graduated here, blah, 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 blah. You know, that might be some connective tissue. You know, if it was in the same fraternity as I was in, maybe there's a little more connective tissue. If they're from my hometown, you know, do your homework on the person that you're reaching out to and try to be connected that way. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and this question is kind of going a little bit back in our conversation. When you uh, mentioned uh, films being overexposed with festivals, um, can the same be true with the script? Uh, should we limit the amount of festivals we submit to? Or is it like, does the number of accolades kind of impact your, your? No, no I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't think, I don't think that the same thing holds, holds true for, for a script. You know, script is just, I mean, there's such a difference between a script and a finished product and an actual film. So, um, I mean, if I'm going out with a script, you know, I'm not going to overexpose it to uh, the distributor side of it, because once you go there, you're done for that matter. You know, if, if I send something over to Netflix um, and they pass on it, it's hard to come back from that. If I go to Netflix, if I go to, to a, a producer and we try to package that a little bit with the right uh, either director and or lead talent and then go to uh, Netflix, then we're in better position. So, you know, you could get, you know. As far as the script goes, you know, no, I, I don't think, you know, in general, you can say if you have accolades, if this script was Humanitas winner and South by Southwest and an awesome film festival and, you know, it has all these accolades, of course, I'm going to take a look at it because that's, you know, that's kind of something bonafide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and then how important would you say is it to kind of perfect the art of pitching or or like what are you looking in a pitch that really stands out and you're like that's the project or that's the writer that i want to work with um somebody who could clearly and succinctly and eloquently get to the point um i i represent a guy who's been in advertising for a very long time he's the best pitcher i know and he's got years and years of advertising experience mm -hmm. and he knows how to pitch a shit out of projects and people get done listening to these pitches and they're like, oh my God, probably, I hear this all the time, probably one of the best pitches that I've ever heard, that they say. Um, so this guy's got true pitching talent, but you know, you gotta be succinct. You gotta, you know, don't, don't dive into too much. Sometimes in pitching, you get too lengthy and there's just too much information that, you know, the receiver of that pitch is just gets a little overwhelmed. And sometimes you can talk yourself out of the sale when you're too wordy. You know, you say things that, lead into questions that the writer or creator can't answer. And that was generated because the, there was just too much in that pitch. Executives out there like to be, like to get pregnant with projects and like to have their hands into projects. And um, I think it's important to keep those pitches to, you know, like no more than like a 20 minute pitch. 
Yeah, no, I agree completely. Um, and um, going along the lines of like uh, the, the clients, approximately, Cindy wants to know, approximately how many new clients do you take on each year? I mean, it's, are we talking features? Are we talking television? Are we talking directors? Are we talking writers? There's so many, you know, there's so many yeah. different types of clients. I mean, if I, if I find somebody I love, I'm going to find room for that person on my roster. Simple as that. You know, I absolutely love this person. I know exactly how to market that person. Um, I feel very comfortable with that person. And I know that person is going to present well in a, in a meeting or that's a pitch or just general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I love somebody, certainly. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take them on. And do you think there's a trend? Like, are there trends when it comes to what uh, networks or streamers or distributors are looking more for? Like, oh, we're right now, like, TV, like you're experiencing like a highlight in TV of like, there's so many shows coming out. Are you then focusing your efforts more into finding new clients for TV or is it just, again, at- Well, television, Carla, television is a business. The feature business is more of a crapshoot. <laughs> um, there's so much programming going on in television that you have a, probably a better chance of getting staffed on a show in the TV space and mm -hmm. developing your career in that space. You can always do features. Even when you're exclusive to a studio on a project, you know, you're still able to, you should still be able to uh, you know, write features and sell your own features. So, you know, I guess that's. <laughs> no, yeah, I get it. Um, uh, well, Nate wants to know um, where, where best to learn the art of pitching? And I would just, I mean, where, I would just say um, how. Would I, don't like it's, it's to, I wonder if Toastmasters is still around. That was an organization that taught people how to give toasts to large you know, groups, or not, not to large groups, to groups of people. Mm -hmm. And they, they basically teach you how to present in front of a, in front of a crew, in front of a crowd. And that was, I know that there was a client that he did that. And uh, this is back in the day, he's a showrunner. And he was awesome. He was awesome at it. And he, he went to Toastmasters. He was kind of a naturally, kind of an outgoing, kind of gregarious kind of, that kind of guy, but he honed his skills with Toastmasters. Interesting. You know, I don't think classes. I've heard of it. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's speech classes. You know, if you're in debate in school, that you know, some of that, you know, that stuff can help you out a lot. But you, you know, public speaking, a lot of people don't like public speaking for obvious reasons. But uh, you have to be good at it. And I think stand up comics are, I, I like stand up comics. People who are get out there and have experience, you know, pitching to, uh, pitching, you know, pitching in front of a, uh, an audience, uh, you know, telling whatever jokes, whatever it might be in front of an audience. That's why I like, and people, when they go into the writer's room in, in the comedy room as well, they're able to, you know, they, they have an advantage. Yeah, no, but sometimes they have an advantage. I mean, a present, you have to have a present. So like that yeah. sticks with you. Yeah, Carly, you need to know when to talk and when not to talk. <laughs> Seriously, I've had clients who have talked themselves right out of a job because they got the job and then, uh, you know, in that writer's room, they just talk way too much and the, the room would come to a screeching halt because this person is just, you know, just not selected with what he was saying and he got let go. Tough. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, speaking of writer's uh, rooms, uh, B. Dolan asks, um, I write features primarily, but have considered developing TV pilots or gaining writing room experience on a TV show. However, I don't live in LA, in New York or LA, and would most likely be a virtual attendee in any room I could be added to. Would you advise me to stick to features or are there realistically remote opportunities in collaborative TV writing rooms? Um, Zoom rooms are still big and probably most shows right now are still doing Zoom rooms, um, but they are starting to come back. These physical actual room writers rooms are coming back um and there's going to be a time where they're all going to be or most of them will be you know real live rooms um you're gonna to have to be in la or new york in that order 
LA and then New York. Yeah, just there's just more going on in LA than there is in New York. Um, but there's nothing going on in Albuquerque. You know, as much as I love that town, <laughs> it's like, you know, the writer's room is just, you know, for the most part, they're just here in LA. Yeah. They're in LA, they're in New York. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and then uh, Nate is asking, is it rare for a writer to just want to sell ideas, but not want to be a part of, of a staff or to continue with a project beyond the submission? Which, I mean. I mean, that's a tricky one. You know, just to be an idea seller. I mean, that's. I mean, that, that's that's. I, you know, like if you are get starting your career, you get in a room and you're and you're escalating in your in, in your career in the TV space, and your staff writer and your story editor, and your co-producer, and now you've got all these ideas in your head, and you're able to get into rooms and pitch ideas, and you know, because you've got so many different ideas, and you want to sell a lot of different material out there, uh, and you don't want to be bound by being in a room. You know, I guess that's that's it's possible, but there's a lot of exclusivity uh, when it comes to making those deals uh, with studios for those those writers' rooms. You know, um, it's a tricky one to you know you, you get to a point maybe someone who's extremely successful who's just able to pitch and doesn't want to be bound by one particular writers' room or one particular show that he or she created. You know, I mean, it's possible. I think anything's possible, but I it's a trick. That's a tricky one. I mean, yeah, it sounds tricky. Um, yeah, it's just like saying, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I want to have success. Yeah, I, I want to date everyone, you know, but I want to be successful in my romantic world. And this is going to come back and be complicated. Yep, most likely. Um, um, and then Leslie's asking, uh, would you like to see a short reel of, of scenes from a completed film by a writer director or links to the entire film? The entire film, definitely. You gotta know what the story looks like. You know, yeah, you can have particular action sequences that look bitchin', you know, but the but the you know the filmmaker's job is to tell a story. Mm -hmm. So you need to see that story you know, beginning to end. And similarly with uh scripts, uh, if they sent you say a query email and they have a log line and synopsis, would you like the synopsis to include the conclusion of the script or leave it at a, like a cliffhanger to kind of um, Perhaps have more intrigue. I, is, is, is the question: Do I want to see uh, a full script, or do I want to see just a synopsis and a logline? I think it's a step process. Well, it, well, with that question, would you accept a query email with the entire script in it? Uh, is like, no, I don't want that. Certainly, don't want that. No way. I don't want people just sending me material like that. No. Uh -uh. Same. Same goes for me to Studio Network. You know guys out there, I'm like, I don't send material. I think it's very presumptuous. Mm -hmm. I say, this is what I have. I'm thinking about you for this because I think you're the right fit. Would you like to take a look? And they say yes, or they say, sounds like I have something, you know, that's competitive. I don't think it's right for me or I'm not right, not, this concept's not for me, but I don't send material. I think there's a, there's, a, there's a legal position in that as well that I think is risky. Yeah, no, definitely, um, I agree. Um, and also, well, Nate asks, uh, is writing a TV and feature versions of a script common? Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> what are some of the downsides that you can see with someone trying I mean, to do I mean, I don't know, you know, I mean, pick your, pick a lane, you know? I mean, is this particular story supposed to be told over, you know, over eight episodes of a limited series? Or is this something that can be, uh, you know, uh, wrapped up with a beginning and a middle and an end in the feature film with the potential of, uh, of, uh, of a sequel or, you know, a franchise for, for that movie, maybe. But, you know, it, it, to develop it both ways. Is, you know, when people write like, oh, I've got three scripts. You know, I've got a pilot, I've got two backup scripts. And I don't, I don't, I'm not going to read that, you know. And writers shouldn't do that either. I don't believe writers should do that either. The beginning writers or anyone for that matter. Because write the pilot, make the pilot as, as intriguing as possible. You know, leave leave it with come on, my God, the reader wants more, and take it at that. And um, going off of that, would you prefer that a client comes with just like the one protected script, or for them to have other works in the progress as well, so that you can have a better idea, better idea yeah. of like what I, they I have to that, offer? 
Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think multiple samples are good because you could write, let's just say in the half hour comedy space, you can write uh, office atmosphere, half hour comedy, right? But yet I want to submit that client for, uh, you know, an ensemble, you know, romantic type piece. You, gotta need, you just need different types of material for different types of shows, for different types of opportunities. You should, your portfolio should have different types of samples. That, yeah. And to that point, is there a specific uh, genre um, that do you prefer one and also that you see like the industry grabbing gravitating towards a little bit more? Um, I mean, I like the sick and twisted stuff. You know, I like the, I like the horror stuff. I like the action stuff. I like something that's going to make me react a little bit. I'm not really into the you know, the, the, the rom-com this much, you know? Um, and there's a market for, for, for that type of programming, but you know, it's just not, it's not what I watch. It's like, if I fall in love with a character, regardless of what that script is, um, you know, I'm gonna be engaged. Um, but generally speaking, I like, the, I, like the dark, I like the dark comedies. That's my kind of, that's my jam. Those are good, I like those. <laughs> Um, and then this person is asking, do you ever meet with folks who are, oh, I think I asked this already. Um, do you ever meet with folks who are already rep by perhaps, uh, this is really, okay, I'm going to try to make sense of it. Do you ever meet with folks who are already rep, but perhaps are not repped in a particular sphere yet, like a repped actor who doesn't have directorial literary representation yet? Yeah, you know, I think I understand that. It's like sometimes people are hybrids, and sometimes they're actors, and sometimes they're they're, they're writers as well. And sometimes if you know that they're repped on the acting side somewhere, um, what I consider on the on the on the literary side, you know, um, yeah, I mean, I, I would. Um, I just I'd be a little weary, you know. Let's just say somebody's at you know, CAA on the acting side, and they're a burgeoning writer, and they're not getting the attention on the writer side. I'd be a little bit you know, apprehensive about that situation, just because, yeah, they, they, at some point, when I get success with that person, you know, and I get them going in their career, well, guess what's going to happen? The, the people over at CA are going to take notice and say, like, you know, you're on the acting side over here, you should be with us. And I try to be a little bit careful with that. I, you know, I try to look down the road a little bit. No, yeah, that, that definitely makes sense. Um, is there a lot of room for collaboration between agencies in that sense, or? No, <laughs> not really, no. I mean, the agents are competitive with one another. I mean, the, the difference, the agents, you know, agents agents on agents are, are very different than, you know, managers and agents. You know, mm -hmm. managers have a tendency to be a little more respectful of uh, clients of other managers. Agents don't seem to have that same type of philosophy which I find to be very unfortunate. I don't come from a place where I'm poaching clients. I have enough business and I don't need to sit there and, and, and poach from people and, uh, and, and try to piggyback off of somebody else's success and hard work. You know, if somebody were to let uh, another agent go and I find that they're, that they're great, you know, that's a little bit more appealing to me, you know? Um, but as I mentioned, it, it, it's a tricky one because I, and again, it's not, I, I don't come from that. I, I'm not, I'm not a dirtbag who's out there just looking after everybody's clients. I'm trying to focus on the clients that I have, not the clients that I want. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> um, and then I think this one was already kind of answered, but I don't know if you can speak a little bit more to it. Um, but what would be more marketable, a great writer or a great director? Wow. Uh, probably the writer, because I think everything starts from the writing. You know, you could be a great director and that's all fine. But if you're a great writer, um, there's just more opportunities out there for writers. You know, directors is such a, it is such a responsibility. There's so much at stake, you know, for a writer. It's hard for a writer to break into, let's say, television and get in that first episodic shot. It's so hard because it's Again, there's so much writing on that. Um, a great writing, a great writing. I, I just think that's where it all starts. Yeah, true. <laughs> and that, and 
going along those lines, um, if you have the background in writing, uh, but not in directing, uh, what would be, uh, would be some good steps to gain that experience in directing so that you can become like a kind of double? Well, shorts, you have to direct shorts. You have to direct shorts and they have to be killer. <laughs> you know, you don't have to spend a, well, you know, you don't have to spend $100,000 on a short, you know, you can, you can do it for a lot less than that, but you're gonna have to have a sample that tells your storytelling ability. Um, you know, I don't want to see reels of people. I don't want to see, you know, um, like a scene of something. I don't want to see that. I want to see a full story. I want to see that filmmaker's vision. Yeah. And David asks, um, have you ever picked up a writer or director whose work you saw at Series Fest and, and or any festival by that? uh yes yes definitely 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 have absolutely especially sundance most specifically sundance yes okay yeah. and so what would be like good steps for writer directors to like get in i mean i we talked about referrals but like is the visibility from other festivals something that you would also consider when taking a client or is it just I think that I think the top festivals are a little more are more meaningful to me. I mean, everyone's got a, a festival. You know, there seems to be so many different festivals out there. It's yeah, and it's like you know, the good stuff rises in any festival, but you know, you can get it overwhelmed with hey, I was in this festival and this festival. I don't haven't heard of any of these festivals. You know, um, that doesn't really mean a whole hell of a lot to me. Um, some of the bigger festivals mean they just carry more weight. Um, no, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, that, that really goes into it. Um, I believe that we're out of time at the moment. Um, fortunately, that's all that we have allotted for, for today. You uh, it, thank you, Paul, so much for joining us. And thank you for everyone who, who attended and submitted their questions. Um, Right. Yes, thank you, Thanks, Paul. Charlotte. We appreciate it. Um, again, our festival uh, concludes today, so please check out the films, BigAppleFilmFestival.com for the program, and our Agents and Managers Conference also concludes today. We have two final conferences. Uh, we have one at 3 o'clock Eastern time with um, uh, Megan Mathis Jacobs uh, from Muse Entertainment, and we conclude at 4 p.m. with Michael Klein from Magnolia Entertainment. So, Paul, thank you so much yes. for being here. We really appreciate it. Carla, thank you for moderating, and uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Carla. Bye, guys. Thank you, Paul. Bye. Yeah.